Black Boxes by Matt Leong. Narrated by Tanya Milevich. Casey, with a K, checked her lipstick in the mirror. She stood in the cotton candy pink ceramic tiled woman's bathroom of the Afton branch of St. Louis Central Bank, generously applying her luscious crimson lipstick. Her mother called it Hot Rod Whore and threw it away when she found it on Casey's nightstand. Casey later fished it out and hid it deep at the bottom of her purse. She loved how this particular shade of red popped in startling contrast to her alabaster foundation. Casey checked her eye makeup, making sure that the thick black strokes of her Egyptian eyeliner had not smudged behind the frames of her cat-eyed glasses. As she left the bathroom, she was serenaded by Mariah Carey over the speakers singing All I Want for Christmas for the fifth time today. She had to hurry now. It was almost closing time, and Bill, the assistant manager, reminded her to collect the daily paperwork to be shredded. Casey had been actively dodging shredding duty to annoy him. He was always on her ass watching every move she made. She would glare at him angrily from the corners of her eyes. The chore of gathering and disposing paperwork to be shredded was simple, and it gave her a moment to get away from the teller line. But this small act of rebellion really brought her great satisfaction. It had been fun until Christina, the manager, grew tired of employees ducking out on daily tasks and set up an assignment board. Christina had the nerve to schedule her for shred and popcorn duty for the whole week. Casey picked up the blue plastic bin that she had left outside the bathroom door and walked down the hall to the shred room. She fumbled with her keys in one hand, trying to unlock the steel door as she held the bin under her other arm. She pushed her way into the dark room. The security door slammed behind her. Casey groped in the dark at the wall and found the light switch and flipped it. The fluorescent overhead lights flicked on with a cold blue glow. The air was toasty from the server rack that was sitting in the corner. Casey found the whirring of the server's fan to be comforting. The small space was filled with a pile of banker's boxes, a stack of chairs, and a small desk with a small flat screen monitor. The monitor was tied into the bank's security system. The screen was split into a checkerboard of all video feeds from all the cameras in the bank. Casey moved towards the shredder, a large, flat, gray rectangular box that sat on top of a wheeled cart parked against the back wall. Above it was a pixelated black and white still image of the great white shark from the movie Jaws, chowing down on the aft of the orca, the boat from the movie. In large white and black letters, the sign read, Watch your hands or Jaws will get you. Casey was still a newish employee, but the machine was simple to use. Danny, who had been here six months longer than her, had shown her the ropes. Bruh, it's super easy. Danny had told her. All you have to do is flip the switch on the back corner. The loud drone of the shredder's motor spun up quickly. Danny pointed to the large square opening on the front of the machine. Next, you just dump all the papers into Jaw's mouth. Casey tipped the bin, feeding the day's collection of deposit slips, receipts, and printouts. Jaws gobbled up the paper effortlessly into strands of paper tape. It's just that easy. Her eyes wandered around the room as she waited for the shredder to finish. She glanced over at the security monitor, watching the activity in the branch. On the top row of boxes across the screen, she could see the other tellers at their windows closing their drawers. There was a view of the empty lobby, drive-up window, and from the camera mounted above the door she had come through. She could even see the back of her own head in a small square in the bottom corner of the screen. The small square in the opposite corner appeared to be a blank feed. Or was it? Casey wasn't sure, but she thought that she could make out something. Something moving in that black box. It looked like a slightly lighter black shape. 
was moving on top of the darker background. She looked at it hard, squinting her eyes, trying to make it out. Something inside the lighter gray shape was moving, like a mouth opening and closing, trying to say something. The shredder abruptly shuddered to a stop, startling Casey back to her task. She looked back at the monitor. The small video in the corner was just a black square again. She picked up the blue bin on her way out and wondered if she had imagined the whole thing. At her teller window, Casey counted the money, batched her checks, and closed her drawer. The bank employees dispersed into the frosty December evening, scrambling to their cars while dodging patches of ice and banks of plowed snow. Casey walked to the 7-Eleven across the street where her boyfriend would pick her up. St. Louis is a city of drivers, a side effect of urban sprawl. People love their cars and their neighborhoods of McMansions, leaving very little tax revenue for a proper mass transit system. That is why so many people are surprised that Casey managed to make it halfway through her 20s without getting her driver's license. She had to wait on boyfriend to pick her up. It was dark and strangely quiet. The convenience store was deserted, with the exception of the clerk that was deeply immersed in whatever was on his phone. She huddled next to the payphone that was crippled by its missing receiver. She shivered as the December wind whipped at her skirt. Even with her heavy cable knit leggings, her calves began to go numb. She pulled her jacket tightly around her. She had forgotten her phone charger and now her battery had gone dead. There was no Facebook, Instagram, Candy Crush, no Snapchat, and no Pokemon to catch. The lack of stimulation was unsettling. Without distraction, she heard noises that she had never noticed before. She turned to peek inside the front window of the 7-Eleven to check the clock that was mounted above the Slurpee machine. It was five minutes till five and boyfriend was late. If she had only remembered to bring her charger, then she could have called him to remind him to pick her up. It was times like these that boyfriend's irrational aversion to alarms became such a huge issue in their relationship. Casey's eyes fell from the wall clock to the security monitor that sat on the counter next to the clerk. It was just like the one in the shred room with the multiple camera feeds split into smaller squares. There was even one empty black square in the bottom right hand corner. In that lone, dark frame, she could make out something moving. A dark, amoebous shape. It was like watching a lava lamp full of black, viscous ink. Even from outside the window, she could see that something was happening. Something was taking shape. Watching it made her dizzy. She felt that she was falling into it. She felt like she was choking. Casey opened her mouth wide to try and draw a breath, but she could not bring in any air. Then a flash of light and a loud blare startled her. She jumped, throwing herself off balance. Casey began to tip over, rolling her left ankle. Desperately, she lunged with her right arm and managed to grab onto the derelict payphone stall before she tumbled over. Casey looked up to see Boyfriend's brown, boxy 1992 Subaru Loyal. It was rusted and dirt-covered, in a mix of mud and salt residue. The ancient driver's side manual window rolled down in a series of jerks. Eh, said Boyfriend. Casey's mother had referred to him as an Ewok, and many would agree. His round shape, bushy brown, unkempt hair, untrimmed beard, and dark, beady eyes made for a compelling argument. What? He asked, with his mouth hanging open like a large mouth bass. She turned back to look inside the store and saw that that small swatch of black on the monitor was replaced with a real-time view of the short hallway leading to the bathroom. Nothing, she said, opening the passenger side door. It whined with age and wear. Nothing is wrong. I'm just tired. A week had passed without any other incidents, though Casey did find herself on thin ice with management. She had almost been caught listening to the audiobook version of The Lord of the Rings on her phone, on the teller line, 
while she used a wireless Bluetooth earbud that was hidden in her hair. She was barely able to palm it and slip it into her purse before the assistant manager could catch her with it. She knew that she was being observed, and that if she got caught, she would most certainly have got written up. It would be strike two against her, and she couldn't afford that. Casey, asked her manager, would you please do shred? The question made her stomach twist. She had avoided going into the shred room since that weird day last week. It left her feeling unsettled. I I'm adding up my checks right now, she replied. I see that. The manager's eyebrows furrowed. But both Danny and Mumta are opening accounts with customers. I have to get out of here on time tonight, so please take care of the shred and empty out the coffee graphs. Casey set down the stack of checks and picked up the big blue shred bin that sat next to her feet. She began to make the rounds, gathering up all of the discarded paperwork from the day. She crossed the lobby, which was draped in many Christmas lights and long ropes of glistening gold garland. She gathered the refuse from each teller window and then the offices of the loan officers. But still, she couldn't bring herself to go through the steel door of the shred room. Casey set the bin next to the door and went to empty out the carafes of complimentary swill that passed as coffee that was made each morning. She took her time, pouring out and rinsing both graphs. She went back to the security door and the bin still waited for her. Casey picked it up and held out the key to unlock the door. She could not bring herself to do it. Her arm froze, the extended hand unable to slot the key into the lock. Casey turned and went back to the break room and found an empty banker's box. She dumped the contents of the bin inside the empty box closed the cardboard lid on top, and stuck the box in the corner. She grabbed boxes of coffee and popcorn and stacked them on top of the shred for good measure, hopefully hiding them in plain sight. She knew she couldn't get away with this for long, and she was going to have to figure out something else. Casey lived with her boyfriend in the basement of her parents' house, in a West County suburb of St. Louis. Casey's dad, Mitchell, was a lead engineer at Boeing. Her mom, Jean, is a neurosurgeon at Barnes Hospital. They waited till their early 40s to have kids. The pregnancy was textbook and almost effortless, with a scheduled C-section. Growing up, Casey wanted for nothing. She floated through school without goals or ambition, managing to get by with as little work as possible. In her late 20s, she knew the days of her low-stakes lifestyle were coming to an end. Casey wondered how much longer she would be able to stay in the basement before her dad started leaving real estate ads for apartments circled in red at the breakfast table. Boyfriend was sprawled across the bed, asleep, mouth hanging open, one arm wrapped around an open box of Fruit Loops. Adult Swim blared on the television. Casey sat at her desk with a bowl of cheese puffs on her right and a can of warm Diet Coke with a bendy straw on her left. On her computer, she pushed on through a massively multiplayer online game. Battleforge as the Blood Elf Warrior, Ursula the Impaler. In game, she strolled onward, brandishing Deathmonger, her spiked morning star, into the Valley of Dread. Casey was on the hunt for this season's rare winter festival relic. This year's prize was the Aurora Frag Gile Limb a sculpture of a leg that would glow and mesmerize your enemies. She wiped her orange Cheeto-stained fingertips on her Hello Kitty pajama top, then tapped the up arrow key, moving her character along the virtual landscape. The walls of the valley towered above her by hundreds of feet. The skies were red, and in the distance, she could hear the war drums of the Skull Troll Clan. As she ran toward the valley, the beating of the drums grew louder. She strode along the path for what seemed to be hours. The sky dimmed from red to purple, then black. Finally, the towering walls of the valley came to an end. As she exited the valley, she came upon a well. The well was rectangular in shape, made of blocks of sandstone that came up to her waist. She used the Shift and Z keys to make her character look down into the well, hoping to see that there might be a relic to be collected. All she saw 
were swirling dark pools at the bottom. Just as she was about to pull her character away, the contrast of the water shifted dramatically. The lighter negative space grew brighter, bringing the darker swirls of the water into the sharp focus of the face that had been following Casey across town. This image was the clearest she had seen so far. She could now make out the shape of the words that the face had been mouthing. Join us. Casey's fingers gripped the sides of the keyboard as the face filled the screen, growing closer and closer. The roar of rushing water began to fill her ears. She could smell the damp, earthy smell of the well water. Her grip became so tight that one of the keys on the number pad shattered, sending a shard of plastic into her thumb. <gasps> White, hot currents of pain broke Casey's paralysis. She lifted the keyboard and slammed it against the monitor, sending it flying. It bounced against the wall, knocking over the can of Diet Coke and sending the bowl of Cheetos flying into the air. The dramatic motion caused Casey to fall back out of her chair. She landed flat on her butt, a bolt of pain up her back. The monitor fell to the floor with a large pop, a spark, and a puff of smoke. Dark streams of murky water seeped from the seams of the monitor, leaving large, wet patches on the carpet. Boyfriend sat up from the bed, mouth open, sweaty hair spikes resembling a compass rose. What the fuck is going on, Casey? Tears streamed down her face. Her gasping mouth reminded boyfriend of his sister's goldfish, the one he scooped out of the tank and dropped onto the floor, just to see how long it took before the fish asphyxiated. I broke my keyboard. Casey held up her bleeding thumb with the shard of broken plastic. Shit, Casey. Take that to the bathroom before you get blood on the carpet. I've been getting enough crap from your mom. I know she will blame me for this. Casey went to the bathroom and with shaking fingers, pulled the sliver of keyboard from her thumb. She ran cold water over the wound, added a dab of antiseptic cream and a My Little Pony bandage. She went to bed. But every time she closed her eyes, all she could see was that amorphous face screaming at her. By three in the morning, she was desperate to sleep. She had self-medicated with a shot of NyQuil. This worked too well, and she slept through her alarm. This series of events set the tone for the rest of the day. She could hardly walk because of the fall she had taken from her chair the previous night. She had broken her coccyx. Now she moved around the bank like an old woman. During her shift, she gave the wrong amount of cash back to one customer, incorrectly filled out paperwork for sending a wire, and the checks in her drawer were out of balance. After all that, Casey did not want to do shred. When confronted by the head cashier, Tara, Casey had no good excuse not to empty the shred bins. What was she to tell her? That she was afraid to go into the shred room because she had seen something in the security monitor? As she collected the daily work, she berated herself for not coming up with some reason for her not to shred. She should have told her about falling out of her chair last night, or about the carpal tunnel in her wrist that was acting up. She had managed to put it up for the past several days. She was hoping to get Matthew to do it for her. He was a total cream puff and would have done it if she had asked nicely. But he was off today, and Bill, the assistant manager, had been on her ass all day because he caught her dozing on the job. She emptied the last of the refuse into the bin and with great trepidation, she walked down the hallway to the security door, unlocked it, and stepped inside. From outside the room, Casey could hear the dance of the sugar plum fairies playing over the speakers in the lobby. She focused on the shredder, willing herself to look nowhere else. She would not look up at the security monitor. She would throw all the papers into the fucking shredder, turn around, and get the fuck out. It was a good plan, and she was sticking with it. She slammed her fist on the switch, activated the shredder, and began to wildly shove handfuls of paper into the mouth of the machine. The shredder's motor was having a difficult time keeping pace with the rate that Casey was feeding it. Confetti-sized scraps of deposit slips began to burp back out of the machine. The motor began to whine and knock as Casey kept cramming in statements and forms. She stared in at the dark, rectangular mouth of the shredder, 
feeding it handful after handful of paper. Casey could see waves of shredded paper tape rolling back and forth inside the machine until it began to spill out from the shredder's mouth. Casey frantically tried to shove it back inside. It was then that she felt the handfuls of paper tendrils begin to twist around her fingers and tangling around her hands. She tried to pull her hands back, but there was no give. The strands of shredded paper tape had the tensile strength of steel cables. Thin, coarse strips ran up her forearms. The wrapping around her fingers constricted. The edges cut deep. Thin ribbons of blood flowed down her arms, soaking the paper strips. Thin rivulets became steady streams of blood, drizzling down on the cement floor. The paper tendrils were pulling her in. She tried to dig in her heels, but her feet slipped on the cement floor that had become slick with blood. She screamed again and again. The only thing anyone heard outside that room was Dominic the Christmas donkey on its sixth rotation of the day. She thought if she could brace one foot against the shredder and she could manage one great pull, she could tear herself free. She threw her weight back and the strands that were coiled around her fingers dug deeper into her flesh. She screamed in pain, but she managed to get one foot firmly planted on the front of the machine. She dug deep, closed her eyes, and gave a great pull against the tangle. She thought she felt the shredder begin to give up just a bit of slack. She felt a little smile begin to creep across her face. I've got you, you... She opened her eyes. And the last thing she saw was a monitor screen filled with cells of agonized, screaming faces, men and women, young and old, each of them disfigured by pain and horror. Shit! It was the last word she spoke before she heard the motor of the shredder kick in with an unearthly whine. Casey, with a K, was found 20 minutes later by Bill, the assistant manager. The first thing he saw was blood seeping out from under the door of the shred room. He opened the door and saw Casey's legs dangling from the mouth of the shredder. The yellow overheat indicator light blinked away as Bill grabbed the blue shred bin and vomited. Casey's body had been shredded. It had caused the collection bin to burst open spraying ground flesh across the walls. A large pile of shredded Casey spilled out onto the floor. Sitting in the middle of the room was Casey's black cat-eyed glasses, with a crack running down the right lens. The police were called and the branch was closed. The employees interviewed and sent home. An ambulance and several police cars remained in the lot, with lights flashing drawing the attention of drive-by gawkers on their evening commute. Inside the shred room, Detective Harriet Gavinport squatted carefully beside a pile of ground meat. Harriet was grateful for the slip-on paper footies that wrapped her sensible black shoes with the chunky heels. She got up carefully to avoid the knee of her chinos from touching the floor and staining her pants with blood that covered every square inch of the floor and most of the walls. Harriet's gloved hand prodded around the small mountain of meat with one of the cheap gray plastic pens she'd found in the lobby. It was a lump of pulp skin tissue entangled with the shredded bloody fabric of the victim's blouse. The walls of the small room were covered in blood and bits. It looked like she had been fed into a wood chipper rather than a paper shredder. The detective had no idea how she was going to write this up. Was this an accident? There were no signs of foul play. And after 15 years on the force, she had never seen anything like this. She had left the city police department to get away from stuff like this. Before becoming a cop, Harriet went to school to be an engineer. She had taken enough classes to know that the amount of torque needed to pull three quarters of a grown woman into a machine with a motor that small was very improbable. A shredder of this size and power could have only taken part of the girl's hand before seizing the motor. Harriet tried to do the math in her head 
on how big an electric motor would have to be to shred a human being. The security video showed that the girl had come in by herself and then the screen just went black. No one in the lobby had heard anything. They went looking for her when they were waiting for her to leave for the day. While none of the other employees were big fans of Casey, not one of them had any motive to kill her. The surveillance cameras even showed that no one besides Casey had even been in the shred room for the last 24 hours. The only person who had even touched the shred room in the last 72 hours was the victim. This is certainly some X-Files shit, she muttered to herself. Harriet suddenly had the feeling like she was being watched. She looked up and saw the blood splattered screen above her. And for half a second she thought she had seen the form of a face watching her. She stood up and looked at the screen. And with the cheap plastic pen, she pushed the power button on the monitor, switching the screen off. Black Boxes was written by Matt Leung. Script editor was Emily Leung. Tanya Milojvic was your narrator. Editing and sound design was by Matt Leung 13 Productions. Some sound effects are from freesound.org. And the spooky Halloween soundscapes by Dan Powell from Dead Signals. Creative Commons music is from Incomp, a tech and nine inch nails. Thank you for listening, and have a happy holiday.